Amen. Turn with me to Joshua 24, verse 14. I am starting a new series this morning entitled, As for Me and My House. Say it with me one time. As for me and my house. Say it again. As for me and my house. Turn to a neighbor and say, as for you and your house. Yes, praise the Lord. I believe that Scripture gives us revelation that we can have peace in our house. We can have prosperity in our house. We can have joy in our house. I'm almost getting an amen. There you are. Praise the Lord. I said you can have peace in your house. Amen. Say it like you believe it. You can have prosperity in your house. Amen. Yeah, you can lay your head down at night and sleep well in peace. Amen. Glory to God. Your house can be a house of safety, a house of blessing, a house of prosperity, a house of joy. I tell you, your house can be a place that you want to go to at the end of the day. <laughs> Not everybody does. Come on, say amen. Amen. But your house can be. It should be. It must be. It's your house. Glory to God. I said it's your house. Why? Let's make it the way God wants it to be. I tell you what. Why not? Let's have peace in our house. So let's have some joy. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Are you in Joshua 24 yet? If you're there, say, I'm there. Again, this message is entitled, As for Me and My House. Joshua chapter 24, verse 14. Joshua says, now therefore fear the Lord. That means reverence the Lord. When, when the Bible says fear the Lord, that means have reverence for Him. I've heard someone say that fear the Lord really means to fear displeasing Him. That I love Him so much, I, don't want, I, I fear displeasing Him. So it's not a terror thing, it's not a scary thing, it's a reverential thing. Alright, he says, therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the other gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. Everybody say that with me. Serve the Lord. Now say it like there's an exclamation point at the end. Serve the Lord. That's better. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I want you to underline that, put a star beside it, highlight it, memorize it. That's for you. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Verse 16, and the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord and serve other gods. We know a lot about Joshua. Joshua is the one speaking here in these verses, these, these very, very important verses. Joshua is the one that the Lord chose to lead the nation of Israel into the promised land. Joshua had the ear of God. God spoke to Joshua and said, For as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Be of good cheer. Be of good courage, Joshua, because I'm going to be with you just like I was with him. I want you to know God is with you just like he was with Joshua. Thank God. Joshua is the one who led him into the promised land. Joshua was the understudy of Moses, standing in his shadow for 40 years. He was a great military leader. He was a great leader of a nation. He was a devoutly faithful man and a man full of faith. He was a great man, this Joshua. A pillar, a pillar in the nation of Israel. And now in these last verses at the end of the book of Joshua... We see that Joshua is speaking his final words to the nation. And this is what he wants the nation to understand. He wants the nation to be established as a God-fearing nation. I think that's a good idea. I wish every nation was. I think it's a good idea for our nation. Doesn't Hey, one nation under God. Praise the Lord. Look at your dollar bill. In God we trust. Come on, say amen. amen. Yes, amen. And so in his closing remarks, Joshua says these three things. He says, you have a choice of who you will serve. Number one, you have a choice of who you will serve. Number two. 
Regardless of your choice, I have made my choice. Amen. That's number two. Amen. Number three, my choice involves my house. So here they are. You're going to want to write it in your notes. Number one, this is what Joshua says. You have a choice of who you will serve. Number two, regardless of your choice, I have made my choice. And number three, my choice involves my house. Come on, say amen. amen. Joshua 24 and 15 says, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Now, we can look at that and we can apply it to us individually. You know, you choose as an individual. We must, we must choose, certainly choose. He is speaking also, though, to a nation. You understand? He is speaking to a nation at this point. He is telling the nation whom they must choose to serve. I want you to know that God deals with nations. I said God deals with nations. And it is a funny thing that in our prayer times, what has been rising up within my spirit over and over again is a vision for the nations. I don't understand the full ramification of that. I don't know how, how Grandview Church is going to play into all of that. But I'm telling you, this is a church that has a heart for nations. We have a heart for foreign missions. We have a heart to touch every corner of this earth. Now, I know we have to attend to our Jerusalem and our Judea and, and our Samaria, but we also must attend to the uttermost parts of the earth. We must think nations. Everybody say nations. nations. Even in the, in, in the Great Commission, Jesus said, Go disciple all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe whatsoever things I have commanded you, and lo, I'll be with you even to the ends of the earth. He's going to be with us. He says to disciple all nations. I think we are wise to have a vision for the world, a, a worldwide vision. That doesn't mean that we forget Denellen or Ocala or Marion County or North Central Florida or the United States or anything else, but I just, we got to, we got to see beyond the horizon. We got, and, and God has spoken to my spirit an interesting thing during prayer times. He, he has spoken to my spirit. And don't ask me what it means or, or how it all plays out because I just don't know yet. But he says that we're going to get into the difficult places. We're going to get in to the difficult places. And, and someone say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm 33 and 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. I want this nation to be blessed. I love this nation. I'm an American. I love this land. I want this nation to be blessed. I want this nation to recognize God as the God of this nation. It did at one time. I don't know what's happening lately, but I, I want us to hang on, church. I said I want us to hang on. Now, God deals with nations. And you know that He will judge the nations? It says in Joel chapter 3, verse 1, For behold, in those days, at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. Let the nations, in verse 12, I just skipped down to verse 12, let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. What does God base his judgment on regarding nations? Well, he said it right here. How nations treat Israel. We got to get that revelation. How nations treat Israel. How nations treat the church. How nations treat his word. How nations treat his name. Come on, say amen. I was talking with, with a, a wonderful friend, Jewish friend, and I said, do you understand that the, the 
greatest constituency that Israel has in the United States is the evangelical church. It is the evangelical church that is pro-Israel. We're the ones that are always voting pro-Israel. We're the ones that are always praying pro-Israel. We're the ones that are standing with you. I said, do you understand that? And he says, yes. Yes, I do know that's true. I understand that. Lord, 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 help us. If the evangelical church ever loses its vision for praying for Jerusalem, because I do not know what will hold this nation out of the judgment of God if we ever turn our backs on Israel. Come on, say amen. Hallelujah. I just think that I just think that we're, we're legalizing the wrong things and, and we're condemning the right things. We're in a crazy time. I said, we're in a crazy time. Time to pray, church. One nation under God. I know, I know they, they said, well, that phrase didn't get introduced until later, you know, in, into, the, into, the, uh, into the, what do they call that thing? What did you say? Pledge of Allegiance, yeah. They said, they said that, didn't, that didn't come in until later, but I'm glad it came in. I'm glad they got it in there. Hallelujah. I know they're trying to get trusting God off the dollar bills, but let me tell you what. If they ever get that thing off the dollar bill, that dollar bill ain't going to be worth nothing. I'm telling you what. We need, to, we need to trust in God. I said we need to trust in God. Well, my point here, number one, my point here is that you have, a church, uh, you have a choice. Nations have a choice. You have a choice. I was so inspired to listen to our guests on Wednesday, how he made his choice, and regardless of what happened in him, uh, to him in his ministry, in his, in his personal life, whatever the government did to him in, in that foreign land, he stood on his choice that he was going to live for Jesus. He was going to preach Jesus. Uh, it didn't make any difference who was camped out at his doors, whether it be government officials or soldiers, whoever it might be. He was going to live for Jesus Christ. Come on, say amen. amen. Say amen. So Joshua, in Joshua 24 and 15, he says, choose for yourselves. Now, there is a great doctrine in the Bible. It's called the doctrine of choice, free will. You get to choose. You get to choose. I've made some great decisions in my life. I've made some crazy decisions in my life. One time, I decided to buy a car that I could not drive. But I just had to have that car. It was a stick shift car. And I couldn't drive a stick shift car. But I had to have that car. And, and that, was, that was about the craziest thing I've ever done. But, but the only thing crazier than that was telling the man who was trying to sell me that car if he would take me on a test drive and let me know how that car drove. So as we're driving along, I'm sitting in the passenger seat. He's driving the car, and I'm asking you. I'm asking him. I said, how do you think this car drives? He says, it's magnificent. This is a great car. <laughs> he said, if I was going to buy a car, it would be this car. So I bought a car that I couldn't drive. I couldn't drive a, a standard car, a stick shift car at that time. But I learned... I tell you, I learned, praise the Lord. It took me about six months driving around Gainesville, avoiding every hill in that city. That's a true story. I went for miles out of my way, so afraid that I'd get stuck on a hill, a red light, you know, not being able to get the pedals just right and rolling into the car behind me. So for months... I, I, drove, I drove the long way around. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. I got plenty of spinal adjustments getting that car going. Glory to God. So did Debbie. Praise the Lord. Hey, we make some good decisions. We make some crazy decisions. But you get to make the decision. One thing God will not mess with is your will. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. One of the most important verses you'll want to memorize. Listen, listen, turn there. Deuteronomy 13 and 19. It says, you know, Moses said, I call heaven and earth as witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, 
blessings and cursings. Therefore, choose life. Everybody say, choose life. Say it again, choose life. Now, who gets to choose? You get to choose. You can, you can take your pick. Blessings or cursings. Life or death. You get to choose. But it says, it'll give, it gives you the answer to the quiz. Choose life. That's the way to go on that one. Choose a life. You say, well, I never choose a cursing or I never choose death. Listen, to be carnally minded, the Bible says, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. When you're carnally minded, I said when you're carnally minded, you're always going to make the wrong decision. Come on, say amen. 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 It says choose life, praise God. Everybody say choose life. Now, this is a very important, very important doctrine because uh, you, can look, you can look in Scripture and you can say, well, w would anybody choose death? Adam did. Yeah. We're all suffering because of it. Yeah. Adam chose the curse over the blessing. He chose death over life because he believed a lie. Lucifer did. Lucifer was thrown out of heaven because he had a choice. He could choose. And he chose to re rebel against God. Every single person in this room that's a born-again, blood-bought Christian made a decision for Jesus Christ. I choose Jesus. I choose Jesus. But listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. You have to keep that decision fresh because you can also choose to walk away from the Lord. Now, I know there's some, there's, some, uh, there's some train of thought, there's some body of believers that believe once you're in, you're always in, you can't fall out. But listen, I've got some scriptures that I want you to put in your notes right now. I want you to write down Colossians 1, 21 through 23. Write it down. I want you to write down Galatians 5, verse 4. I want you to write down Hebrews 6. Verses 4 through 6. Now, Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 says, And you who were once alienated, enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. So he's talking to reconciled people, born again folk. Verse 22. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, blameless, above reproach in his sight. If, verse 23 says, if... You indeed continue in the faith. So there's some possibility that you might not continue in the faith. Do you all see that? If you continue in the faith, grounded, steadfast, and are not moved away. So there's some possibility that you might be moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard. Okay, that's Colossians 1. Now, turn with me to Galatians 5, verse 4. I'm going to read the amplified version because it makes it so clear. If you seek to be justified and declared righteous and be given a right standing with God through the law. See, here's the deal. Paul is writing to born-again people, but those born-again people were being pulled back under the law by Judaizers who said, no, it's not all by grace. You have to live under the law as well. You have to be restricted by the law in order to really, really, really be born again. And Paul absolutely repudiated that. He said, no, it is all by grace. And he says, if you get pulled back under the law, you are brought to nothing and so separated, severed from Christ. You have fallen away from grace, from God's gracious favor and unmerited blood. Do you see that? It's possible to fall away. It's possible to be severed. All right. Now look in Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. I'm going to read the New Living Translation. For it is impossible... To bring back to, repent to repentance those who were once enlightened. Now we're talking about born-again folks. One, those who were once enlightened. Those who have experienced the good things of heaven and have shared in the Holy Spirit. You're only going to get the Holy Spirit if you're born again. People who are not born again don't get the Holy Ghost. Verse 5, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the power of the age to come. In other words, those who have had eternal life. Verse 6, and... Who then turn away from God? It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance 
by rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing Him to the cross again and holding Him up to public shame. Those who have rejected the Son of God. It is possible to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior and then reject Jesus as Lord and Savior. The choice is yours. I said the choice is yours. Now, you don't reject him by sin. You reject him by... So every sin you, you commit doesn't mean that you've just fallen out of your salvation. You reject him by rejecting your belief in him as Lord and Savior. You, you reject his lordship. You reject his lordship. That's a rare thing, but it's a sad thing. If Adam, living in the garden, walking with God, made alive by this spirit, can reject God and fall... Come on, church. Come on, church. I said, come on. All right. Now, God will not violate our will. So make sure that you choose wisely every single day. Now, there's plenty of choices to make. You can choose to be a Christian. You can choose to be Muslim. You can choose to be a Hindu. You can choose to be a Buddhist. You can choose to be Jewish. You can choose, choose to be anything. He says, choose for yourself whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served or the gods of the Amorites, you can pick a god. You can choose hey, to serve anybody that you want. You can make one up and serve that. You can choose anything, anyone. I choose to be a Christian. I said, I choose to be a Christian. 30 years ago or before, I chose Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. And over these last 30 years, every single day, I have got up thanking Him that He is my Lord, He is my Savior, that I am blood-bought, born-again, spirit-filled, Bible-believing, devil-chasing, dead man-raising, water-walking, born-again Christian. Why? Why can I say that? Because every single day, you mean you got to get born again every day? No, you don't have to get born again every day, but you need to make sure you are born again. The Bible says, let a man examine himself to see whether he is in the faith. Every day I get up and I say, thank God the Holy Ghost is on the inside. Thank God I'm living for Jesus Christ. Thank God Jesus Christ is interceding for me. Come on, you know where I'm going. Are you with me? Are you with me? I choose. I choose to be a Christian. Academically, I choose to be a Christian because historically and archaeologically, the Bible is proven to be true and accurate. Amen. Prophetically, I choose to be a Christian because the Old Testament says two things. There will be a coming Messiah and there will be a New Testament. And we got both of them. Amen. Come on, praise the Lord. Spiritually, I choose to be a Christian because Christianity is the only thing that makes sense. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse a man of his sins. All the other religions of the world say you can work it out on your own. No, 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 you can't. How can a sinful man cleanse himself of sin? No, only Christianity says there's nothing that you can do. But Jesus has already done it all for you. But most importantly, personally, I choose to be a Christian because I have personally met my Lord and my Savior. He has come to me. He has spoken into my life. His Spirit now lives in my heart. I have met Him in the midnight hour. I have met Him in the worst of times. He has been with me in the worst. He's been with me in the best. He's never forsaken me. He's never denied me. He has healed me. He has comforted me. He he has encouraged me. He has inspired me. He has been my Alpha to my Omega. He is the author and the finisher of my faith. I have met my Savior and I have found Him to be a good shepherd. I have found Him to be the way, the truth, and the life. I have found Him to be my all and all. And I have found in Him and only in Him am I complete. Hallelujah. I am a Christian because I choose to be a Christian. It is not a heritage. 
that was handed down to me though I was raised in the church. It's not something you get genetically. It's not a Christmas present that Aunt Mamie gave you. It is a choice and a decision that we personally make to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. 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 Now, this is a choice that you will make every day. Verse 20, uh, Joshua 25 and 15 says it seems evil to you to serve the Lord. But and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day. You're going to make choices this day, tomorrow, the day after. Solomon is a, is, a, is a wonderful example of this. Solomon, we have the book of Proverbs because of Solomon. We have the book of Ecclesiastes because of Solomon. In fact, Solomon, next to Jesus Christ, is the wisest man that ever lived. God spiritually imparted wisdom into Solomon. His kingdom, the age of his kingdom, the son of David, Solomon, son of David, his kingdom was called the golden age for Israel because there was peace in his kingdom and he was so wise in his ways. But look with me in 1 Kings 11. Now Solomon, 1 Kings 11, verse 3, Solomon had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. He had 1,000 ladies that he was accountable to and his wives turned away his heart. The wisest man on planet earth. The man who built the temple. The man who ushered in the golden age of Israel. His wives turned away his heart. Verse 4, so it, was, it is so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God as was the heart of his father David. He had it all. But by the time he was old, he had forgotten who had given it to him. You've got to make a decision every day, church. You, I say you've got to get fixed on some things. You've got to decide some things. Because let me tell you, what you tolerate, you begin to imitate. And what you imitate, you will start to replicate. And then, oh, turn to a neighbor and say, oh, my, my. Oh, my, my. Say, that's not me. And that's not you. So number one, you have a choice. Number two, regardless of your choice, I have made my choice. That's what Joshua said. But as for me, in Joshua 24 and 15, as for me, in my house we will serve the Lord. As for me, Creflo Dollar said, a quality decision is one from which I will not turn. You know, there's some things in your life that just really need to be written in stone. Some things you just don't back up on. Some things you dig your heels in and say, nope, nope, not me, not me, not me. I have made my choice. I, I know, y'all make your choice, but as for me, I, I made my choice. I said, I've made my choice. Now, his choice was based on the preceding verse, uh, Joshua 24 and 14. And you really need to look at this. Verse 14, he said, this is what his choice is based on. I'm going to fear the Lord. I'm going to serve him. And I'm going to put away anything that stands between me and God. It says, now, therefore, serve, fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served. So here's the three things. This is what Joshua did. Number one, reverence God. Honor Him. Seek to please Him. Number two, serve Him. Obey Him in sincerity, meaning genuine feelings, and in truth. And number three, put away the other gods. Put away anything that stands between you and God. If it has to be turned off, unplugged, unmailed, change your address. Come on, church, say amen. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Number two, I've made my choice. Number three, my choice involves my house. As for me and my house, we, everybody say we, we, we. we. now he's speaking for his house. He's speaking for his house. He's saying, as for my house, your house is your place of influence. 
It can be literally your home. It can be the, the house, of, your house of worship. It can be where you work. And, you know, it can be your marriage, your children, whatever. It, it's your place of influence. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I know growing up, I, I was not a voting member of my household. I was not a voting constituency in my home. Come on, were you? No. no. My mom raised three kids. I was the third. There were three boys. I was the third. And by the time I came along, she had pretty much ironed everything out. She figured out how to raise boys. And she had the look. She didn't have to raise her voice or raise her hand. She just had the look. And, and I knew with my mom, if I got the look, that was it. It was as for me and my house. I will serve the Lord. I got it. Praise the Lord. Come on, y'all have been there. Amen. I remember when I, when I would get upset with my parents and, and uh, man, I, I'd get sick because I, I rarely had an unspoken thought, you know. I, I pretty much, not anymore. And I, Jesus done good work in me. But at the time, I rarely had an unspoken thought. And so I usually share what I was thinking, you know, and that usually got me into a lot of trouble. And so as I was getting sent down the hallway to my room for a, a time out, you might say, and, and uh, I would always say this as I was going down the hall. I would say, I'm not believing this. Have y'all ever said that? I'd say that. I, Mom, I, I'm just not believing it. And I'd do it as I'm backing down the hall. I, I wouldn't stand in front of her and say it. I'd back down the hall. I'm, I'm not believing this. And her response was always the same. Well, believe it. And you know what? She made a believer out of me. You bet I came to believe it. <laughs> there, there are plenty of things I learned to believe. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Anybody like that? Yeah, as for me and my house, I was listening to a radio program coming down to church one day. I was listening to a, a ra talk radio, and the, the lady was the uh, host that day. And um, she said, raising her kids, that uh, I guess that morning she'd had problems with her, with her children. And she said, you know, sometimes you have to be the unpopular parent. In other words, your kids aren't always going to agree with you. And it makes you very unpopular. But so what? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Your kids aren't always going to... You're not always going to be the popular mom. You're not always going to be the popular dad. You're not always going to be the popular one in the PTA. You're not always going to be the popular one. But you know what? If you're sticking up for righteousness and you're looking out for your kids and you're doing the right thing, well, well so what about popularity? Let's be popular with the Lord. Paul said... Paul said, I don't try and please man. I've got to please the Lord. Amen. Come on, church. Amen. Hallelujah. Why? Because as for me and my house, in Genesis 18, 17 and 18, verses 17 through 19 in the New Living Translation, this, this is why you, wanna, you want your house to come under, under the service of the Lord. This is what... God said, should I hide my plan from Abraham? The Lord asked. For Abraham will certainly become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. I have singled him out. So he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Then I will do for Abraham all that I have promised. Look at that. He will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. The scriptural pattern for the Christian home, you, you could say it is faith, hope, and love in action. You could say that it is the fruit of the Spirit, love, Joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance, or self-control. And those, those, things, those things would all fit. But I'm going to focus on, on one thing here in my closing thought. And this is it. And I'm closing right now. This is it. The Christian home should be a culture of peace. 
should be a culture of peace. The word culture means that it is the common behavior. It's the accepted practices. It's what everybody agrees on in the Christian home. It, it's, it's what you expect to happen. That's the culture of the home. Churches have cultures. Countries have cultures. Businesses have cultures. Well, homes have cultures as well. And the culture that we want to cultivate in the Christian home is one of peace. Psalms 4 and 8 says, I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Doesn't that sound nice? To lay down in peace and sleep. And then in Ephesians 4 and 3, Paul says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Peace bonds things together. Unpeace. What's the opposite of peace? Strife breaks the bonds. It divides. But peace is what pulls it all together. Debbie and I have been married for uh, 30 years. And we have a very peaceful home. Because we've made a quality decision that we're not going to speak words of strife to each other. We're not going to undermine each other and pick on each other, whatever. Uh, you say, well, in my house, we just have to have it out in our, our marriage. we we got you know, to fuss about it and fight about it and, and uh, break the dinnerware. Well, let me, let me encourage you. Let me encourage you. One, buy paper plates. Number two is, n- number two is try peace. Try peace. Give it a try. See how it works out. Try peace. Because here, here's the key to success in all of God's principles. You start where you're at. You, start, you don't condemn yourself. You don't look at somebody else and compare yourself. You just start where you're at. And it's possible, it is possible that within your marriage and within your relationship with your children or your in-laws or whoever it might be, that you can have a peaceful relationship. Why? Because you guard your words and you guard your attitudes and you bring the Spirit of Jesus into it. Now, does it mean that Debbie and I have agreed on everything? Absolutely not. But we do honor. And honor is the bridge when agreement gives out. I used to tell my students at the academy when they would come see me and they'd say, I just disagree with my math teacher. I said, I'm not asking you to agree with your math teacher. I'm asking you to honor your math teacher. When there's honor in the classroom, there is peace in the classroom. Come on, somebody. Amen. This is what peace will do for you. Number one, peace opposes dysfunction. And for some reason, our culture celebrates dysfunction right now. Have you watched television lately? Every reality show is nothing but a celebration of dysfunction. Somebody's going to be pulling somebody's hair, yelling and cussing and kicking. Okay? So peace opposes dysfunction. It diffuses anger. It engenders humor. You you know, when Debbie and I go to bed every single night, we have to end up on a a happy note. I'll say, Debbie, tell me something funny. Or we got to watch something funny on the television. we got to end the day on something funny, something that makes us laugh. And and fortunately, we got these two little dogs that we love so much, and they make me laugh so hard. All all I have to do is pick Kelly up, and she just makes her, oh, I just love her so much. She just makes me laugh. She just makes me laugh. She just makes me laugh. And so... So y'all need to come over to our house (laughs) before you go to bed and rub some puppy bellies and you'll be so happy. I promise you. I promise you. I woke up the, the other morning. I rolled over and there was Kelly on my pillow. We were eyeball to eyeball. She, she, she was like, what? what? What's it? Peace opposes dysfunction. Number two, peace promotes honor and agreement. Agreement in the creative order. And we're going to talk about all these things down the road. Agreement in values. You know, as long as something's negotiable, it's not a core value. Agreement in what is right and what is wrong. The primary role of a parent is to teach a child what is right and what is wrong. And that's it. Agreement with the Lord. And number three, peace instills vision and encouragement. Again, we'll talk about all that later.